is, he put on a slide that he says, after 500 surgeries, I just realized that the human body is not made to have surgeries. And that is something that really impacted me because when a surgeon with the caliper of Alejandro say that, is because we have something else to learn. And that's the reason that it impacts me. Um, the, the subject that he's gonna share with us is gonna be also growing factors into the joints. And we're gonna try to steal his brain because this is a totally different perspective of what we've seen. And I want that you guys see what I'm seeing for maxillofacial surgery in the last two years that I've been exposed to Dr. Arnett's information. So I pass it to Hamid, so he welcome our guest. Well, Alejandro, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it's wonderful to meet you and talk to you. And um, you. from my, uh, my own perspective, I've been looking forward to this because I know there are, um, there are things that, uh, um, we, you know, we have in common and have a lot of interest in the same growth factors that Javier uh, was mentioning. But more than that, um, there is a huge void in our understanding and our, I mean, uh, restorative dentist. I'm a restorative dentist and, uh, and, and of course I do TMD uh, patients, but in, there's a huge void in understanding of how you guys look at the, the dynamics and the, and, and, and the movement and the uh, uh, real uh, mechanics of the joint versus the way we look at it. And I think that has been uh, probably one of the, the, the main main points that uh, and often uh, we really don't understand why the, what the other, each other are thinking or talking about. So um, I'm looking forward to really uh, uh, seeing what is it that you guys see because obviously you guys have been at it and uh, studying it in much more detail than, than we have um, from a different point of view. Um, but also I just found out that you're a gator and you know as a gator you know I'm, I'm uh, you already have my vote, so let's do go Gators. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the invitation, Javier and Hami. Uh, this will be a very good experience to share our different point of views in the same joint. Many years ago, when I start, that's the coffee machine. Sorry. No, no it's pouring. When when I started doing doing lectures on TMJ, I used to put a a cat face with uh, with a one blue eye and one brown eye. And I used to say, you know, we are like the cat. Frost, us, frost, frost to people, they believe in one joint, they treat it the way they think, orthos the same, we are doing the same, but we need to have the same eyes because it is the same joint, it's easy. And then when you review the literature, the literature is kind of a bewilderment, you know, and you re review literature and you, you look for success on TMJ treatments, very much the ortho, the prostas, and the surgeons jumps into what I call the magic number, 88% success. That's very much about there. When you do, when you read critical papers like meta-analysis, systemic reviews, that's where they are. But then when you come into more practical clinicians, then I like to, to separate what is a, a TMJ patient. Because we can have TMJ patients because muscle problem, because joint problem, because both, because systemic diseases, because trauma, because fractures, because tumors, because different things. And we need to coincide first that the objective of our treatments should be to unload the joint, decompress the joint, unpressure the joint. We need to agree that we need to improve the function of the joint and we need to relieve symptoms. 
load function relieve symptoms let the patient open and chew but all treatments must go into these directions no matter if they will go with braces within the prostate way or in the surgical way the point is diagnosis and diagnosis has to be seen not only by the surgeon first mistake don't let your surgeon do the the diagnosis the last diagnosis the last one the word god's word no way has to be treated by the dentist by the prostate by the ortho so what i get in my office is the garbage tmj patients garbage the one that was already seen had 5 10 15 splints had ortho had maybe two three times crowns comes with a little car you know full of x-rays and mris so that's the garbage i get and we need to understand that a patient that wants to go with the surgeon with the oral and maxillofacial surgeon because joint problems will be a patient that maybe is not in the 88 percent success it's out of there it's different so not all tmj patients are equal so i don't know if this could be a good start to yeah this no, absolutely it's a great point uh, that's a great point that we a lot of times we don't take in consideration that uh, you get the end stage type of patients a lot of times mm -hmm. and uh, we probably get the early stage or middle of the road type of patients good point yes. Alejo which kind of be the, the, the surgeries that you more often perform it in these complex cases before let's talk about because you're like the Bible, before and after. What happened before you decided to change and what were the cases that you did before? And <laughs> yeah, let's put it this way. I was trained in Mexico. I did dentistry in Mexico. I did oral and maxillofacial surgery in Mexico. Then I went to University of Florida in Gainesville, do a TMJ fellowship and an orthognatic surgery fellowship with Dr. Frank Dolwick at Gainesville. So I'm a Gator fan. After 30 years, still a Gator. <laughs> I was telling you that this is my, this is my surgical cap, okay? So Fantastic. You had me at the Gators, okay. <laughs> so, but in the late 80s, uh, Bill Farrar, uh, was saying the disc is displaced. Hey guys, you need to help me. I cannot do more. See? And they described the algorithm of the disc is going to be displaced with reduction, without reduction, you know, you know perforations and all that. And surgeons became pretty good in those cases doing displications. End of the 80s started the protocol for TMJ open surgery to, for disc applications. But also the arthroscopy, arthroscopy started, procedures started to go into with the lenses, the lenses go inside the joint and watch the joints. And, and we became into a big problem there. Why? Because Patients after arthroscopy, they were doing better, less pain or pain reduction, not cure reduction. We need to be pretty honest here and realistic. And better opening and function. And the disc still displays. So that, that in that time, it brought a, a, a new question. And then we start doing MRIs in all our TMJ displication surgeries. And I remember a Brownstein paper came out saying after two years, 
60% of them has the dis displays again. Wow. So, so we were doing arthroscopies. It was the arthros arthroscopy fever at that time. And then, and then we came with the arthrocentesis. Very simple procedure. Placing two needles here in the upper space or compartment to watch the joint. At that time, we used to say we're flushing the bad spirits. We knew there were cytokines in the, in the knee, in shoulders, but there was no study in the joints until Howard Israel in early 90s. So arthrocentesis became the less invasive procedures with pretty much the same results are as arthroscopy and arthrotomy, open joint. Let me that stop you there, Alejo. Hold on a second. Why arthroscopy by itself made the patient feel better? Because the point is you are releasing adhesions, you are flushing cytokines, so you are allowed in the disc, even if it is displayed, to have movement, freedom of movement. So synovial membrane will produce hyaluronic acid again. So you will have again fluid exchange with cells A, A, A and B and you know nutrition and all that. So that's why it, came, it became good. Now, when you review cases that were patients were treated, now let me talk a specific patient with a very well localized joint pain. Here, when you ask the patient, where do you have pain? If the patient goes moving all, all the face, the neck, that's not a, a, a internal derangement case. Symptoms are pain has to be constant, very well localized in the TMJ. One finger, patient will go here. Pain get worse with function, opening and chewing. Okay, so it's not diffuse. The more far away the pain is from the joint, the more the patient could be a myofascial pain dysfunction or other types, but not an internal TMJ problem. Second part is when you do MRIs, I mean, we know, we know 40 uh, studies says that 40 to 7% of the population has the TMJ disc out of place. So if you do an MRI, you have 40 to 70% chances to say the disc is displaced. This is why, no way. And there is no correlation. There is a beautiful study by Nitsen in 2017 that proves that there is no correlation between disc position and symptoms. Impressive, isn't it? There is no correlation of the results, no matter if you have an early disc healthy joint or a very displaced disc, deformed disc, osteoarthrosis, results has no correlations with the stage of the MRI or the disease. So second point. So when we start doing every time more arthrocentesis, or arthroscopy, we start seeing there was no place for open TMJ surgery for disc replacement. And you review those papers. I don't want to say names or authors, but when you review all those papers, there is no evidence in in meta-analysis and systemic reviews, systematic reviews, there's no correlation that you have to treat 
this, this displacement early because it will affect mandibular growth. That's why they want to go early in surgery, surgery early in those patients. There's no correlation that if you treat those cases as soon as possible, you will avoid the degenerative, degenerative joint disease with time. There's no correlation there. So I don't agree on this repositioning. That's why with base evidence literature and with good clinical results on arthroscopy or arthrocentesis, we, we did become, we, we, we became less invasive. Then, other important point, if you find in your town or around closer of your town, whatever, a good dentist, a good prostor, a good orthodontic, man, your cases will go down. TMJ surgery and you will be out of market, <laughs> okay? Because there, there are beautiful techniques to, to produce TMJ stabilizations, condylar positions, to get muscles more relaxed, see? And 70% of the patients, they don't have dentofacial deformities. So they will, they will need no orthognatic surgery. Or you have Rick Robley. If you have dental alveolar problems, corticotomies and orthodontics will help. So to me, a this displays TMJ patient with pain, even with osteoarthrosis, they do deserve conservative treatment. They need to have a good prosto ortho or dentist to do a spleen, to do the programmation, to do mago spleen, to do, I mean, there are many techniques that I'm not expert on that but try the conserva conservative protocol. If the patient has bone erosion, condylar bone erosions, we've been doing growth factors for more than 20 years, and they have helped to reduce pain, to get a cortical bone in the condyles, not to rebuild the condyle again, not to grow back the condyle, but to have cortical. And even with a small condyle, you can have stable centric relation, centric occlusion. Even if it looks small, that doesn't, that doesn't matter. So that's our experience. That's why we're going a lot into, with arthrocentesis, growth factors. We release adhesions, we take out cytokines, inflammatory disease, uh, fluids, I mean, uh, and growth factors. But all these cases are with a spleen in their mouth. Yeah, that's an important point. Before we go there, let's talk a little bit about this hiding enemy that we have that is called adhesion, so fibrotic or scar tissue that we found in all these traumatic cases. Coming back for these cases that you say, really patient that is symptomatic, is able to point it, do you find out that that is more in the acute phase? Because maybe this patient that has condylar reabsorption of all this, the mechanoreceptors are not into the capsule, so the patient cannot feel uh, the pain. But I guess the patient that you see in is these patients with a lot of condylar reabsorption, really a lot of facial asymmetries as a result of yep. this condylar reabsorption. Now, uh, we want to know a little bit about for that uh, standpoint, because sometimes we underestimate the adhesions. Um, it's difficult to observe them in MRIs. They, They're not being, they, they cannot be seen on an MRI. Exactly. And they confusion for some differential diagnostic into the treatment because sometimes you don't know what that condal is no movement and the worst part is you don't know how much movement you can recuperate so yes. can you tell us what you see in those joints what is that incidence of those adhesions 
that maybe we don't see or how we can have something that helps us to make a differential diagnostics? Um, yeah, first of all is clinically, you have the patient in your office, there is no way to know if the patient has adhesions, fibrillations. Second, you get an MRI. Not all my patients get an MRI, first of all, okay? But you get the MRI and um, there is no correlation between the disease staging and symptoms. There is no way to see adhesions on an MRI. Even more, if you review good meta-analysis, there is enough doubt in some cases to see the contour of the disc. There is a 20 degrees possible error to see if the disc is displaced a little bit or pretty much on a little back. 20% error of diagnosis. Wow. Another one. The gold standard is that an MRI has to be seen by two different radiologists. radiologists. So one, one diagno the diagnosis by one radio radiologist could have errors. So MRI is it's not the gold standard. It's not the best. It's not. Remember when we were in undergraduate, when we were in dental school, I will say these are these are auxiliary studies for diagnosis. But it's not your diagnosis, final diagnosis. So MRIs, you cannot see adhesions. Even okay. more, it's it's. It's, it's hard to see perforations. Alejo, when you have a patient that they have condylar reabsorption, and as a result, we have an occlusion breakage, and of course, we have a facial asymmetry. What are the considerations to treat those patients? Are you gonna try well, to bring the muscles to balance? Are you gonna try to reposition that joint? having a compensation of the amount of reabsorption. How does biomechanics work for the- Friday, Friday, I will show some cases like that. But let's put a patient that will have dentofacial deformity, dentofacial malocclusion, condylar resorption, this displacement, okay? The big pie all together. How do we start? First, I need my prosto. I need to have stable mal occlusion. Okay, we need to find where do the condyles want to be stable. So I ask the prosto or the ortho, and they will place a splint. Uh, once they have the splint, two or three months therapy with the splint, okay? Then I will do, if the patient is still with pain, and I will add, sorry, I will add medications. I will add vitamin, the, the Arnett and Gonson protocol, okay? I will add vitamin C, vitamin D. I will add omega-3. I will add uh, Felden, Feldeni, if, if it is piroxicam, if in case has pain. And if the condyle has moderate erosion, no good cortical, I will add simvastatin, which is for cholesterol, but it's a very good antiacid and it helps. All this, the idea is to, to slow down all these cytokines, the, uh, MMP is an interleukin 1, 1B, 1, 1.6, and tumor necrosis factor, rankles, and all those. 
So the patient is, is it, with medication. I'm sorry, is this for that period of three to four months with the orthosis? Correct, correct. The patient is with medications. It was, is with the bidisplin. If the patient becomes with no, no symptoms, good opening, no pain when he bites, let's say four months, I do a CT scan and I have a better cortical, I won't touch the joint. I won't do even an arthrocentesis. Okay? I won't place even growth factors. And I don't care if the MRI has a very crazy disc or crap out. Okay? Now, let's set the same patient, but he is with the splint medications, but has locking. He cannot open the mouth, gets locked, has pain. Perfect. I'll do the arthrocentesis to produce upper joint compartment expansion to break adhesions, to bring out cytokines, fluid, put growth factors in. Keep the patient with the splint. Splint is very important. There is a nice paper by Dorit Nitsen where she proves in these patients that the internal TMJ pressure goes very high. Internal TMJ pressure is 30 millimeters mercury, 30 millimeters. That's the normal TMJ pressure. That's where the cells can be having a eating or you know, sending nutrients, there is oxygen more than 30 millimeters mercury, then you have a hypoxia. These patients, according to Dorit paper, they went up to 160, even 220. Imagine all the ischemia. And then you have oxidations and all that stuff that we know. And when she plays a bite splint, the internal TMJ pressure went down 80.6%. Wow. So, good news. Yes, there was a myth in dentistry that used to say that TMJ reduced joint, that, that occlusal spleen reduced TMJ pressure. It is correct, it is true. So, no matter what you do in the joint, you need to reduce the pressure unload the joint to help oxygenation again. Okay, so all my cases that I do arthrocentesis, they have to be with an occlusal splint. Once we have the patient with a malocclusion stable, if I do sedation, because I'm gonna do now, let's say thermolars, my patient is under IV sedation, relaxed. And I do, I do the, the Dowson technique, double vector right. technique to, to see the centric occlusion. The patient is biting exactly, exactly in the bite spleen, the ortho or the prostate or the dentist did. So I know that in the OR, that patient is on a stable condylar position. Um, and if the patient is I'm sorry, free of pain, can can you uh, um, in that in that case can you uh, uh, tell me in your bimanual uh, uh, you know twelve o'clock bimanual uh, uh, manipulation in there are you really seating the joint up and back or are you bringing it up and forward? I'm I'm sending them. Up, not back. I don't okay. want back. I don't want to, to do posteriorization of the condom. Okay. No way. Because that, that was what was taught in Dawson when I went back, but that was 94, mm -hmm. 96, but I, I don't know no, what that is. No, no posteriorizations. Okay. Now, when I have those cases that are 
stable malocclusion, free of pain, good range of motion, and they can eat my Mexican chicharrones, tostadas, you know, all the hard food. Then, okay, the patient is ready to go to ortho treatment. It will take like three months, four months. But they go to ortho treatment. And once they are ready, I'm, I, I track my, my patients every month, every two months to see what the ortho is doing to do, to check the, the TMJ symptoms and all that. Once the patient is ready for surgery, do the orthognatic surgery, then we have to do all the 3D technology. But I know, I know my partner, my prosto or my, or my ortho had a stable condylar position. Otherwise my 3D doesn't mean nothing, okay? Alejo, it's a condition that we treat when we take TMJ because we always trying to find out what is the best mandibular position to improve the kinematics, right? To try to create the best arch of closure and have a clean path. Now, it's multiple things that we've been talking for a physical therapy standpoint that in many conditions we have lateral issues and we have the disadvantage versus maxillofacial surgeons that we need to work with the entire mandible as an one entire unit. Yep. Talking with Dr. Arnett, you know, I always dig in trying to find out, but again, because this is something really that we were apart for too many years. So I'm trying to find what is that middle point. And then many of his explanation, he said to me, Javier, is that you guys always think that everything is resolved sagittally and you don't see that when we make the osteotomy, now we have these conducts with freedom that many times is lateral strength what is creating that the disc harmony is not working properly. And then talking with many of you, I always see and you guys describe the way that you feel that joint in the in the operational room because i think and i put this example it's like when you have a chicken and and you're gonna cook it that you see those joints kind of handle and contain each other's because you can isolate in them i think the more analogy people can feel it so what you can say that how many cases that you guys operate is more medial tension to the medial poles than anything else. What, what can be like uh, what you've seen during all these years that you've been doing surgery, what is the common denominator in these patients? Well, let's just, let's just try for this. We need, first of all, the surgeon has to do a proper condylar setting for sur in surgery. What I mean is, if this is my condyle, you know, here, lateral, medial, anterior, posterior, and I open the mandible, I do the split, I bring the mandible forward, whatever, and, I, and now I'm going to place the hardware, the bone plates and the screws. It's very important to avoid bony contact because a premature bony contact could open or close my ramus, my mandibular ramus, and my condyle will, will move like this or will move like this, okay? It's like, like you guys, if you have a premature dental, posterior dental contact, okay? Now, we have to avoid those bony premature contacts. We need to avoid them to take them away. The second part is the surgeon must avoid sending the condom to posterior or posterior and superior back in the fossa on a sagittal plane because the condom will get resorbed. Now, frontally, or on a coronal view, 
the condyles need to sit, sit here. Not medial, not lateral. You will have malocclusions and you will have then bone resorption. So our, we have to have a proper way to sit, to sit the condyle and a proper way to place the hardware. Otherwise, we will produce problems, iatrogenic problems, in other words, okay? Now, if you set the condyle appropriately, there are little movements that you, we cannot avoid. A little movement like this, or like this. If this movement of the condyle, pondylion, the most superior point of the condyle, it's rotating in condylion, you're not displacing condylion, that's the key. We've been measuring our last 300 cases. And there is a little, little movement on that rotation, you know, and the movements are 0 0.6 millimeters, 1.1 millimeters. We cannot avoid that. But the condyles remodel and maintain stable. Okay? So clinically speaking, to me, the key is you need to set a proper condylar position. I just had a talk with a surgeon from US, US, and he says, he said, you know, guys, you in Latin America, you take too much care about condylar position and torquing. And we surgeons in the US, we, we, don't, we never talk about that. And I said, Luis, I know that because you never look your CTs post up. And if as a surgeon, after orthognatic surgery, you're using a lot of elastics to set the occlusion, it's because you left the condom with a sag or with a torque. The common thing after orthognatic surgery is to use one, two elastic in the frontal part. to keep vertically the forces, muscle forces here, and to avoid joint compression or loading, muscles loading. So, and this is the reason why many people still wanna do this positioning because they need like a pillow between the condyle and the fossa because they are pushing too far the condyle, compressing the condyles and they need that pillow, that, that soft tissue pillow there. Alejo, how much the, the surgery has been changing the last 20 years and what is the more dramatic changes that can benefit the patient? Because it has been dramatic, uh, I mean, just to get for us as dentists to prescribe a maxillofacial surgery, it requires that you really understand what's going on. And unfortunately, oh, that's not the case. So what happened 20 years ago that we became so scared about it? How's been the change of maxillofacial surgery in the last 20 well, years? Well, let me put it this way. 30 years ago, 25 years ago, we thought that internal derangements, that means this displacement with reduction, without reduction, perforated, adhesions, fibrillations, synovitis, capsulitis, okay? We thought that internal derangements were a different pathology than osteoarthrosis or degenerative joint disease. It was a big argument. And we thought they were different. By now, by now, we know that the internal derangement is just a sign of degenerative joint disease. They are the same. They are in the same 
you know, system. Even more, there are patients with normal disc position, but with condylar erosions. So the mistake was, we thought they were different entities. And we treated different. Now, what is the best indication to utilize growth factors into the joints so the users can say, okay, this is a case that we requires. Also, you and I, we spoke and in your technique, you're working more about in combination with arthrocentesis. But uh, for instance, Bruno, uh, Bruno's technique is goes only with growth factors. Can you touch a little basis between the difference yeah. between the two? Yeah, growth factors are very, they are very good anti-inflammatory. It's an anti-inflammatory. Okay, they're very good on that. They are very good in helping cells to produce hyaluronic acid. Our joint, our synovial fluid is, is from hyaluronic acid, okay? Growth factors help to diminish free radicals. It's very good to help to, to diminish MMPs, metalloproteinases. It's very good with all those cytokines and all that stuff, okay? So it's a very good anti-inflammatory. It's very good with hyaluronic acid. That's why we use that, okay? Now, there are studies comparing corticosteroids, synthetic hyaluronic acid, first or second generations, Duralon is a, is a good one. It costs $1,000, this I range for one joint. And growth factors. Growth factor has proved they have better results than hyaluronic acid or corticosteroids, okay? And with no secondary effects, no, no secondary effects. So that's why we're using growth factors. I've been using those since more than 20 years ago. Now, why Bruno only plays hyaluronic acid? Why I do the arthrocentesis? And then the growth factors. There is one, uh, to, me in, to me speaking uh, Seriously, is because he loves Rioja wines and I don't. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I could love Bruno be, and I know be, his wines and they're fantastic. Could it, it be that uh, he sees perhaps uh, less complicated cases than yours or, or that you see? Yes, I think so. Yes. I will say this. A, 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 a biological reason is that you need to make you need to put the disc in mobilization the disc has to move freely and without loading and the way to make that happen is washing washing the compartment pushing the additions if you only place the growth factors, you are not working on that part. So maybe the light cases, easy cases, that they are not locked. If you place the growth factors, it will work because it's an anti-inflammatory product, okay? From your own platelets, okay? So it is working that way, but it will, it will be necessary to do a comparative study, one joint without arthrocentesis, the other joint with the arthrocentesis, both with the growth factors. And it has to be, you know, a randomized blind study, multi-center. So, so by now I told Bruno, I said, Bruno, I've been doing this for 20 years. 
and I prefer to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Yeah, so, that's a good point. Perfect. Yeah, and, and there are studies done on just placing esteroids or just placing hyaluronic acid and the studies done with arthrocentesis. So there is enough literature in arthrocentesis and there is no literature in just placing the growth factor. So, so I think light cases, clinically light cases, MJ cases could be good just like that. Beautiful. Awesome. So Alejo, now we're gonna go to, to, to the questions, to the standard questions. Honestly, we can steal your brain for really a long amount of hours because honestly, I think this is what we know less, right? Because we don't familiar with all many of these surgical. And for sure, we have multiple, multiple questions. We appreciate that you made this simple uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. I know that it's a huge horizon of, of uh, information about multiple uh, surgeries into the joint that can be uh, replacement joints. Uh, here, at least, we used to get cases that eventually is cases that we can understand that maybe with a holistic approach can work. And then we find out that many of these cases have been really on their joint replacement well, and stuff like that. Well, and let me put it this link. way, Javier. Javier, let, let, let's go into those very critical, heavy questions, okay? Because that's what we need to share. The idea to be here is to share and, 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 and yes. to obtain information. Total joint replacement. Total TMJ joint alloplastic replacements. Do they work? Yes, they were fantastic. My oldest case has 23 years old, okay? That's amazing. And it can be stock joints, you know? You ask for a stock joint, small, medium, large, and you adapt it. <laughs> or customized joints, that's where we go. Personalized, customized joints. Those are fantastic. They work great. Even more, they are having better better success than knee joints or hip joints, okay? I'm, I'm very proud on that. Now, let's do a new question. We know it works. Is it necessary? We know that appendicectomy works, okay? Tonsillectomies work. Is it necessary? That's the other question. Yes, it's necessary. When are they necessary? Well, ankylosis patients. They got ankylos, you free the bone, they have no condyles, they have no stable mandibular position, they have no joint, okay? So they were very good to put the mandible forward, to open the airway, and to put it on a stable occlusion. Tumor cases, condylar tumors, chondromas, they work very good. Trauma, condylar trauma, the condylar got resorbed because the trauma. Uh, there is no condyl now, it disappears, multifragmented. Very good to place them there. Now, TMJ total joint prosthesis because you have a small condo. No way, Jose. It's not an indication. Sorry, it is not, it's an abuse. Period. Simple. Okay. And, and I know there is a lot of surgeons that love to place the joints and they see a really small looking osteoarthrosis condo and they said it's better to put the prosthesis because we don't know in future if this condo will work what what so if you do an mri on my knees my knees has noises my knees has some pain 
but I still run, I still on the bike, I still in the gym. So if you treat my knees by MRIs, you will put joints in my knees and I won't be able to do all I do. So I don't treat MRIs, I treat patients. Total joints are very good, but there is an abuse on small condyles. Sorry to say it, I don't care, that's the truth. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing. All right. We're going to come to our uh, next segment of our, uh, our uh, interview, which is the question, the standardized question. And I know you would be looking at this from possibly a different point of view, but in your explanation, actually, you were not that far away from what the way we think. So when I pose this question to you, what is occlusion to you? And uh, who were your influences? Uh, who were you influenced by in, in that ideology? Okay. What does occlusion mean to me? Occlusion means the guarantee to have a stable treatment. So you just look I at it from a stable joint stability point of view. That's correct. I can do condylar equilibration. I can send you back stable condyles, but you need to give me a stable occlusion. Otherwise, whatever I do will go to garbage. So I depend on you guys. There's no way I can do something without you. Fantastic. Who did I learn that from? Woohoo! That's very good. The first guy I met on occlusion was a guy in Mexico City. His grandfather and dad were dentists too. And he was very hard in occlusion. He went to study to Europe with Gerber, with, uh, with Sandro Palla. And in the 80s, he believed on on long centric occlusion and things like that. Then I went to Florida. There you had a part, the big man, Parker Mahan, in the sure. pain center. He did know how to do stable occlusions. He did know. After that, then I've been listening many speakers, but I'm not an expert on that. But my two influencers were those. The first book I bought on occlusion was, it was from Sandro Pala. <laughs> Sandro Pala. We take it no, that's what we distract. Yeah, we so, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk about all of this stuff later. Um, all right, so I, I think, um, um, you know, second question, I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna see, aside from the stabilization in the joint, do you also nowadays consider uh, any other factors such as posture, airway, um, you know, cervical stability, anything else? Yes, airway is another key factor for stabilization. And if you don't have an airway, your brain will send an info to your muscles to stress, to contract, because you need to breathe. And there is a lot of studies where sleep, obstructive sleep apnea disorders and bruxisms, they go like very parallel, okay? Then cervical, cervical factors. I'm not an expert on cervicals. So the two orthos, I work the most with them. They have followed a lot of, of the cervical leaders and they, they do all the stabilization on cervicals and all that, but I'm not an expert on that. I count on them. I see. Fantastic. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, let's talk about the diagnostic records that you take uh, before you uh, categorize and, and uh, categorize your patients for what, what diagnostic records do you take? 
Well, I have my clinical history. I, I will have all the clinical info. I'll like to do my, my CAS models. I, I am a true believer on malocclusion. I am a true believer if I see where facets, you know, those centrals or cuspids are flat. It's like a man, that guy has a lot of bruxism and he will just send to garbage my TMJ stuff if I do something on that guy, you know. So I'm, I'm pretty critical on bruxism. And then I will do, I will do my CT scan, my cone beans. Yeah. A few times I do MRIs because I just got tired of doing MRIs on all of them and there was never correlations between symptoms and what you see in MRIs. Alejandro, are you so, taking the CBCT in habitual occlusion? What's the uh, uh, No. Uh, I do first ha a normal ha habit occlusion. Let's say the, the uh, uh, in, in, in central uh, occlusion. Okay. Yeah. And then um, I will ask the patient to be treated to put him in whatever it's called centric relation, okay? If they use the Mago stuff or any other spleen. Once we have that, then I do a new CT scan. I want to observe condyles. I want to observe then maxillary positions and airway in a patient with centric occlusion, centric relationship, I mean. Otherwise, I don't believe on that mandibular position, okay? So how can I do a facial exam, analysis, predictions, all that, if I don't have a stable mandibular condylar position? So the second CT will be after the stabilization? Correct. Okay. All right, so I think uh, the next question is, uh, is pretty much answered. Uh, what instrumentation do you use? You're talking about uh, CBCT and uh, sometimes MRIs. Any other uh, measuring device that uh, do you use? No, I won't. My ortho and prosto will do, will do all the other part. All right. Um, and Next question is also uh, goes to the same thing. Uh, uh, do you use interdisciplinary approach? And uh, yes. yes, you you always work with the ortho. All my cases. Oh. If my patient doesn't want ortho or doesn't want prosto or both, I don't want to be the surgeon. I don't want to be his doctor or her doctor. Fantastic, understood. At, I mean, at that time, at this time of my age. I want to do things in the right way because that's the way I enjoy my professional life. All right. Um, the, the next question is, uh, it goes to the establishment of the sequence. I think you, you've discussed that a little bit first. You get their CBCT and, and, uh, and, and categorize the patient and then they go to, uh, to the ortho or, or the prosto. Uh, let's say, let's say um, they, they did need, they, they missed a lot of vertical. Uh, has it been sometimes that your prosto or your ortho said, hey, uh, listen, you know, there's like a eight millimeter uh, discrepancy or 10 millimeter discrepancy in the, in the posterior vertical. And uh, what do you think we do this surgical? Do you ever correct that surgically? Yes. But I want to see normal molar cusps. So you still and do what I have? Okay. Yeah, and if I get the models, I put them in, in perfect occlusion. I want to see posterior molar dimensions correct. Then I can do surgery. But if I do surgery, I put the patient in occlusion, but I don't have anterior dental, vertical, and posterior dimensions. I mean, it's crazy. Of course, of course. Yeah, stability. So, yeah. So, so you, you, you know, basically you want correct dental anatomy so you can get good intercuspation for stability. Correct. We're not going to be able to do more, this on flat, 
Flatty. Yeah. yeah, and hammy, even more. The ortho will, will have better braces placement. Of course. With normal tooth length or normal tooth proportions. Absolutely. Absolutely. They, they, they will be more accurate. Absolutely. And then once I do my orthognatics and I do the maxillar expansions and all that stuff, buccal cusps are, are very important in the molars. I want 1.3, 1.5 overbite in the molars because that will keep the maxilla expanded. Flat molars, it's equal to maxilla relapse. Okay. I understand. Really important. Sometimes I will love, I mean, I said, sometimes I said, why I didn't do prosto and ortho myself? <laughs> then it's no, I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> then, then you never have any peace in your life. Yeah. yeah you, 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 it never ends. Um, so um, I, where, when uh, you get these cases, where do you start with your analysis for the facial uh, facial aesthetics. Is it right at the beginning when you diagnose the case is probably going to be surgical and you start to think about facial aesthetics or, or later? I will, I will, I, no, I will set at first a problem list of all the face, the occlusion, the maxilla and and mandible bones positions and the joints and the airway. I will do the list. I now I have an impression. Once the patient is on a stable malocclusion, stable condylar position, then I'll do my final diagnosis. So then I know what I have in the profile and I do pictures and I calibrate the pictures in the software. So then I can measure in the softwares, in the software, in the fab software, Nemotech fab. I, I do measurements frontally, lateral, and I know what it should be changed. And then I follow the Arnett's forms to know how are we going to bring this upper lip forward, let's say? Surgically, orthodont orthodontically, maybe the tooth needs to be retroinclinated, proinclinated, and exposure, maybe that tooth needs to be recontrued to give more incisal edges. So I'm, I'm crossing what has to be done by ortho, by prosto, and by me. Yeah, that's part of what the question about the 20 years in surgery, I was expecting you to talk a little bit about 20 years ago, we didn't have the tools that we have 3D oh, today. 20 years ago, right. we didn't have the tools, one. Second, there was no a very good relationships of understanding between prosto orthos and surgeons. So, I mean, I was looking the case and you used to say, okay, move this tooth. We were very good in cephalometrics. So we were telling the ortho how to move or what to do. And then we were just drawing a 2D Ceph, making the movements there, an STO, surgical treatment objective. And then we used to go for the face bow and get our centric, put models, cast models on the on the articulator and do the surgery there. Wow. It was the, the dark times. <laughs> the prehistoric times, right? It was the dark times. Time. Wow. Okay, let us, let's, I think you have pretty much answered this question in the, in the beginning uh, with the benefits of PRGF and PRF. This is question number eight, but uh, you went into a lot of details in there, so um, I'm not sure if I should spend a lot of time on it. Uh, so you oh, basically, you, you are for it. You just said, honey, something really good. You said PRGF and PRF. Yes. No, you never said PRF. Okay. Plasma I, I, fibrin, it's a different protocol. 
We're getting a lot of feed. Uh, yeah, we are vibration. Okay. But I'm willing to hear what he says. Yes. Uh, we have, to, yeah. Let's see, can you hear me better? It's, no, it's something with your uh, speaker, I think. Uh, we have some interference in there all of a sudden. I can hear Javier very clear, okay. but. Yeah. Then one thing I can do is leave the meeting and, and connect again. And okay. Maybe we can help later. Can we do that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect, thank you. Alfredo, it's really, if you're it's really amazing to tell a totally different point of view. I think it's a lot that we have to educate also about these new modalities. In but uh, overall, uh, what I see is that actually I was very surprised that his thinking is a lot closer to what we think uh, than I thought. You know uh, what? Because he's working in an interdisciplinary environment. I mean, they really... The, no, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Oh, much better. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, okay. Sometimes right. the internet gets too busy and happens this. Yeah. So, so, I was so, saying that PRGA um, is yes. a different protocol than PRF. Correct. Completely. PRF um, use more leukocytes. That's right. And leukocytes increases mm -hmm. cytomation. Yes. Inflammation and in these joints, I don't consider it could be good. I have never tried it, and I haven't seen any. I'm glad you cancer. said it. I uh, I uh, I was trained with Dr. Um, uh, Anitua. I purchased my machine from him first, about 13, 14 years ago. I've been using his protocol. However, uh, yes. I do work with some local dentists here sometimes, and I do teach both. And I tell them, you know. Uh, yeah, my my idea is the same. If we're going to the joint, I do not want to go with the IPRF. So I'm again, again very glad that we're on the same yes. wavelength. Thank you. Fantastic. All right. Question number nine. All right. So uh, have you taken notice of uh, any postural changes after your treatment? Yes, and the, the orthognatic cases, I mean, they, I do a lot of class two cases. 80% of my patients are hyperdivergent class two. Yeah. And they are like this. Exactly. Because they need to breathe, they go, they need to breathe. And when you do the surgery, they come, Relax, straight, her head is a little bit down. And when you follow the CT scans, it's not only the, the, the maxillomandibular complex that went forward like this. The hyoid bone goes up, the airway is open. Airway becomes, of course, bigger, thicker, but moves more anterior. Completely, the whole airway moves anterior. And when you see the, the cervicals, they are also anterior and straight. Yeah, that's a point that I want to say, Alejo, because we were talking actually with you and also with another maxillofacials in, in Santa Barbara. And actually that was something because people, is, after I mentioned, everybody started popping out lateral cefts before and after surgery. Yes because we have an appreciation, and that's why we made this question, positive and negative, because I consider a patient class two with deficit of airway, it improved the head posture by a mandibular advancement or by maxillary advancement, is huge for the airway. But also we need to remember that the constrictor superior and medial pharyngeal muscle also get attached to the hyoid and to the chin. And then and he have the tendency to see that many of these, by maxillary cases, not just surgically, many cases that many patients that we put anterior devices for repositioning, they have the tendency to flat the neck a little bit, is pulling it. And that is, I consider, not a good compensation because, you know, we need that lordotic curvature. But it's mm -hmm. good that you also see it surgically. So, oh, yes. we 
And I have not followed, I have not tracked pretty much the class three or asymmetric cases. But most of my pictures, they go from shoulders to head. And surgeons used to ask me, I mean, that's, you just get the neck and the head. And I said, no, I need to see the shoulders. And surprisingly, the, the class three or asymmetric cases, they get like more straight shoulders. Yeah. You know? But there is a change in the posture. I'm not an expert on that. I would love to know more about that. That's, awesome. That's great. We have good lecture here, uh, Alejo. Check the lectures. It's two lectures that maybe you're going to be interested. Mariano Rocabaro and the chiropractor that is talking about how the sutures uh, give up and stuff like that okay. for you guys that doesn't just go. And it's he's good. in Mexico, isn't he in Mexico? Dr. Walker? Uh, Walker is in Mexico now. He's in Puerto Vallarta. He decided to move to, to have fun to, to Mexico. So that's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, the next question um, really goes, uh, and I, I, I really hope at some point if you had get a chance to do look at some of the other uh, uh, speakers, um, because I'm sure you're going to see the trend uh, that we're going by and we're seeing in all the, in our uh, in our speakers that there is a lot of physiology that's coming into their uh, thought process in reference to uh, to occlusion, and uh, there it's a more holistic with a W, not not a H here, but a W whole person type of uh, vision of uh, what occlusion is. So, uh, uh, in, in reference to that, my question uh, was, uh, do you think that we were going to see some of these ideas and some of these more uh, organic and holistic uh, approaches to occlusion ever taught in dental schools? Yes, I think so. I mean, I, in the last years, I've been looking for a kinesiologist and, a, and someone that will have a kind of a holistic treatments and you know therapies and genes and all that to put my patients together as, as a more integrated but i haven't found one in monterey i mean if you if you if you know someone that want to come to monterey please let me know mm -hmm. for sure i think that we need to go into more comprehensive kind of treatments or plan, multidisciplinary plans. yeah yes correct Fantastic. We're treating patients. We're not treating just. Exactly. Exactly. We're treating the whole person. Correct. All right, Javier. Do you want to pose the last question? So oh my God. Uh, this question <laughs> is honestly, and I really want to 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 hear this for your surgical standpoint, hmm. because it's still part of the study that I've been doing using the jaw trackers that I use. I describe movements that doesn't necessarily the movements that they describe it in the literature. Do you really consider that the events that happen into the joint uh, are, are an initial rotation and then a translation? How do you think those internal mechanics, mechanics happen in dynamics, not in the operating room? Because in the operating room, you can isolate the movements really easy because you can hold that joint to do, I mean, you don't have much cooperation uh, when the patient is under sedation, right? So you technically can do whatever you want. But just as a generic question, how do you think those internal events happen? Uh, because it's a, sometimes a, a confusion in the terminology because we understand that arthrokinematics are different than osteokinematics, right? Arthrokinematics mm -hmm. will happen to the joint compartments and then osteokinematics in reference with the condyle. But I think it's a definition that it make it both sounds the same. What do you think it happens? Can you help us to clarify this concept for a surgical standpoint? Well, from the surgical standpoint, when the patient is sedated, that means the patient can hear you and will obey, okay? And the patient, the only difference is his muscles are relaxed. So 
he can do openings, he can do translations, he can do protrusion, okay? But in conscious, you guide him, you're the most no. for the patient. No, 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 no. This is he sedated. has a light is sedation, okay. he will okay. do it. Okay. Okay? Now, with general anesthesia, it's different. You will imitate, you will move, but this is very, very limited. What I, and this becomes as a surgeon, it's only feeling, feeling. I know that I can open the patient softly as he was before the surgery. In other words, patient was put to sleep, general anesthesia. And under general anesthesia, I can do opening and the patient, if I want more, the condyle will translate to have maximum opening. And I will do laterals, protrusions. And you can feel in your hand, it's, a, it's easy. It's an easy movement. There's no force. Once you finish the surgery, you want to know that the condyles translates and moves soft. If the patient is kind of locked under general anesthesia, you have a torque, you have a condylar torque. If it is hard to do laterals and protrusion, you need a torque, okay? But that's it, there's no other proof. So what happens into the joint? Is a rotation or a translation first? Or is a combination of both? Or depends on the a structure? I mean, the first, the let's say the first, the first 15 millimeters, you have a condylar translation. After that, you have to do is a rotation, I mean. After that, you have to do translation, okay? The condyle has to move out of the fossa. But what I mean is, if you don't have soft movements after surgery, it's because your condyle has torque or a sag. Torque is, I send it out of the fossa, laterally, medially. Sag is, I put it below, lower, and it's touching the medial wall or lateral wall. Some of those are. And that's why you don't have soft movements. But that's a hand feeling. There is no armamentarium. There is no technology in that moment that you will put some electrodes and, and a machine will tell you where is the condom. No way. There are two different things that people are doing. One is Julio Cifuentes that you know him. He's with the Arnett Group at Santiago de Chile. Yeah. And he will do CT scan during surgery. And he will see if the condoms are properly placed. There are other people, very few people, very, very few surgeons that what they do is during surgery, you put the hardware in the mandible, you're done, okay? The anesthesiologist will awake the patient, so the patient will, will obey you if you ask him to open and close and see if the condoms move with freedom. And then they put the patient back to sleep again and you keep closing or doing whatever. That's, that's kind of crazy. I mean, that's- Are you do mandible first or maxillary first? I do always mandible first. Yeah, the always. same magnet philosophy. Beautiful. Yes. We have one question from the uh, viewers, Dr. Sam Sadati. He's asking, uh, is there a software to do the aesthetic facial stimulation, uh, simulation that help you decide whether you need surgery or what kind of cor uh, correction is needed to achieve a desired facial aesthetic, orthodontic, orthognatic, um, cheek implants, whatever? Yes. 
It helped me. I will do decisions clinically and in the software. If I have proper clinical measurements and then I have proper photos, my photos has dots here, here. Right. It's a 20 millimeters difference. So when I have the photo in the software, I will calibrate. I will measure 20 millimeters dot to dot and everything I measure in the face gives me a yeah. real number. Sure. I don't know if, if I answered the question. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, to uh, complement. Is, is that the same uh, fab uh, suit yes, from the... Yes, Nemotech. The Nemotech. Nemotech. So yes, Nemotech. I will complement that. As a fab, we have a new, ver a new feature that is called... A, uh, oh my God. Um, God, you can volumetrically create the appearance of the changes. So they made it because we have cheek augmentation by maxillary morphine is yeah. called and morphine. So we yeah, can and when you the follow the, the cephalometric study, then you have not only vertical and anterior or anterior posterior uh, position, but you will yeah. have also how thick is the soft tissue? Because you can have perfect tooth inclination and protrusion and perfect maxillary position. So anterior and vertically, you are okay, but the soft tissue could be as thin as mine. So the software can measure your soft tissue and then you will decide if you will do fat graft or hyaluronic acid or whatever. Collagens or anything. Yeah, remember that that uh, part of the software was designed by Dr. Arnett. So he put the combination yes. between cephalometrics and soft tissue cephalometrics. Really interesting features. This is it awesome. Is, is. We have somebody here, as a fact, Alejo, Jorge Ortiz. He say, Yo voy a Monterrey. So it looks like a, this is a, a physical Man, therapist. And then, so you find your, your guy here. So you guys maybe can contact it That's internally. Great. What is the, uh, so this is Jeff. Now Jeff is asking, Alejo, what is in the grill tonight? This Salmon. Is, yes. Oh my God. So yesterday the last, was, was hamburgers with why you meet. That's the story with don't, Alejo. Don't bring any Rioja, please. No, today will be I, Bueno. I, I love Spanish wines. I love Spanish wines. You do? Okay. And he didn't even tell you about the collection of tequilas. So the last time that we were together, he made me an amazing degustation about every single tequila with the story, oh, yeah. how I need to drink it, what I need to... I mean, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Alejo, thank you so much. Honestly, we will honor. have been hours. We just needed something in this hand and something in this hand because we see the smoke sky, smoke cigars and have a scotches that keep us longer. Brother, yeah. you're amazing. Thank you so much to share your knowledge with us. You really inspire us, educators in a subject that we're not too much familiar. It's beautiful to get to see occlusion for all different these different perspectives. I think we super excited about everything that we learned for you and still more. I hope we have more opportunities in the future to get to know deeper more of these procedures and be able to understand how you're going to refresh them, you know, with the people mm -hmm. and how eventually we need to know how to uh, interact in, in an interdisciplinary treatment with a, with a maxillofacial surgeon. So thank you so much for my heart. Yes, yes. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we did it again. Another hour and a half, uh, one hour seminar. Uh, we uh, went over uh, by another half hour again, as our normal trend has been the last few ones. Um, and thank you so much. The information was so good. I didn't even feel it, to be honest with you. I, I just looked and I'm like, Yeah, okay. somebody say, are you sure that you're a surgeon? <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am, and I love to be a surgeon. And I love beautiful. my patients. But I love my patients. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. No, it's, it's Thank you fantastic. so much. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, and uh, and your time this evening and this afternoon. Uh, it's been a great learning experience, uh, Ale. Thank you, Hami. It's my honor to meet you, 
Thank you, Javier. My pleasure and my honor to be with you guys. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Go Gators. Go Gators. Go Gators. <laughs> See you Friday. All right.